Nine Facebook messages sat unattended in his inbox. Vikas felt too ashamed to open them. He couldn't remember what the conversations were about. The throbbing in his head assured him that they were not exchanges he would be proud of. Pretending it hadn't happened wouldn't solve the problem. Yet, he couldn't find the courage to apologize. A well-drafted email sat in an open window. He read through it for a third time. The tone was finally right. It was casual enough. It emphasized how open he was to taking on something new in his life. Attached to it was a document highlighting his professional achievements. It was not a CV. It had no mention of the work he had done with the party. No music played, but he carried an earworm through the morning. The chorus to Devil's Haircut looped in his head. The list of recipients he had chosen for this email was complete. The regular group of people he went to for advice were part of it, but he'd also included a few distant acquaintances. People Vikas knew to be well-connected. His anger had settled into a constant simmer. It could now be channeled. Emotions were no longer driving him. One of the pages in his browser displayed a variety of spray paint. The cans were not as expensive as he thought. The other page was more interesting. The article was a compilation of the most notorious acts of vandalism in history. It made for interesting reading. Parag and Anirudh wouldn't even notice a graffiti tag you put up somewhere, he thought. With his tongue, he poked at a piece of skin hanging off the roof of his mouth. He couldn't recall how he'd burnt his mouth. The urge to pick at the dangling fold of flesh was unstoppable. Each time he tried to rip it off, he felt a sharp pain followed by a distinct metallic taste. Vandalism was more complicated than he'd realized. While his lack of skill with a can of paint seemed like a hindrance, the bigger concern was the risk of getting caught. The paradox was simple. He had to find a place that was extremely public for his work to be noticed. That in turn made it almost impossible to create without being seen. The skin hanging from the roof of his mouth loosened. The urge to get back at the party had quickly evolved into an obsession. How long could he let people get away with walking all over him? As he left home, Vikas began the process of deconstructing the massive task before him into smaller, more manageable components. There were step-by-step -step workflows, a list of pros and cons and a detailed summary of the variables, all of which had to be factored into his plan. Hi, how are you? A woman asked as she walked into the compound. She carried a bag full of groceries. Hi, very well. Vikas responded. He was still stuck with his thoughts. He didn't know her name. She lived on the second floor. He guessed she was about his age. That was probably all they had in common. Vikas had wondered what it might be like to get a drink with her. Not so much because of any fantasy he harboured. He just wanted an insight into what her life was like. His curiosity was always kept at bay by the fear of her husband freaking out or his parents losing their mind. How come no office today? she asked. She stopped and turned to face him. Oh, nothing, just easy day, so took it off, Vikas said as he walked past her. He'd taken a few steps before he realized she'd stopped and probably expected him to do the same. Social niceties. What was that fucking spaz? He whispered to himself. He needed to stay sharp. The grogginess could not be allowed to take hold. The stakes were too high. There was so much to do. Sad Bangla, he said to the auto driver. Vikas paid close attention to the route the driver took, scanning both sides of the road. He paid attention to the holdings on the way. The billboards that normally get relegated to scenery passing by were surprisingly abundant. Two campaigns in particular caught his eye. The first, of course, was Parag looking down at him. He made detailed mental notes of each location. The second was a welcome distraction, like cold water poured on a heated engine. There was something very soothing about looking up at Devika. She held up a smartphone. It looked like she was inviting him to join her as she took a picture of the two of them. Hello, are you in town? Feel like getting that drink sometime? He typed on his phone. Send message to somebody. 
From the movie he'd seen, the term of what he was trying to accomplish was tradecraft. He popped into an ice cream parlor and bought himself a cup of Sitaful Delight. When he finished his leisurely scoop, the sting had gone out of the afternoon sun. He hailed another auto. This time, he was headed back to Oshivara, back towards home. Raste mein do-teen jaga rukna padega, he told the driver. Vikas directed him. He chose what appeared to be a convoluted route. The turns he took made little sense. The driver wondered whether Vikas was on a joyride or genuinely lost. It didn't matter as the meter ticked on. One of the natural outcomes of driving an auto in Bombay is that very few things seem strange. The driver seemed unfazed watching his passenger pull out his phone and take pictures of nondescript buildings. The locations were odd. They were busy roads but not the popular markets. When Vikas was done, he had the auto drop him at a distance from his house. He waited until the rickshaw was out of sight before he turned around and walked. It was going to be more complicated than he'd imagined. One by one, he began to plug the holes, developing contingencies for scenarios. He tried not to restrict himself to probable scenarios. He needed to be ready for anything. Murphy's law was not to be ignored. He ducked into an ATM. Before he punched in any numbers, he checked his math again. It seemed to hold. 7,500 rupees. It was an amount larger than his regular withdrawals, but not large enough to draw any suspicion. The machine belched, counting out his cash. He looked up at the CCTV camera. I need a disguise, he thought to himself. It was the last piece of the puzzle, a practical disguise. It was almost 6.30 in the evening. Strewn across Vikas's bed were parts of his wardrobe retrieved from the depths of his cupboard. Some of the clothes were so old he couldn't remember ever owning them. There were football jerseys from school. He couldn't imagine how he ever fit into them. There was a sweatshirt from a college festival. It had a discoloured patch on it that he refused to examine closely. It was probably some sort of mould. Hiding under the mound of clothes were his old baggy jeans, a remnant from the time when the likes of Nelly and Ludacris made them cool. He found sweaters that he had never worn. His school uniform was wrapped up in a plastic bag. It was covered in ink with all sorts of messages scrawled across it. Hiding in the same bag was a school yearbook. The photos in it were of kids that he remembered from childhood. The adults they had grown into were no longer a part of his life. What do we owe this cleaning to? Vikas looked up to see his mother serving the mess he'd made. Was looking for some clothes to run in. I'll clean it up. The lie flew out without a pause. Okay, don't leave this stuff out for me to clean up. Actually, now that it is out, why don't you separate the old stuff you don't wear? We can give it away. There is so much junk collecting in there. You want me to sit with you? Not today, mom. His mother left the room. He was relieved she hadn't noticed the neat little stack of clothes he had put away. They sat in a pile behind his bed with purpose. It would have been difficult to explain. The hair in the sink was now a slimy wet blob. Vikas looked into the mirror. The face that looked back at him wasn't the one he was accustomed to. It was hard to remember the last time he'd been clean-shaven. He cleaned up the sink and flushed away the nastiness that was once his beard. He went out for a run. It was better than his last run, but was still uncomfortable. After dinner, he fought the urge to get a drink. He set an alarm and spent most of the evening in bed, struggling to catch some sleep. It was unfamiliar, sober and in bed at 11 p.m. His morning was carefully chalked out. Vikas took his time organizing his backpack. He didn't bother with breakfast. He wasn't sure how much sleep he got. The dullness that he had become accustomed to was not around. The bright sunny day wasn't welcome. He sat in an auto, stuck in 11 a.m. rush hour traffic. It was hot and he was exposed to the fumes from the vehicles around him. Every glance from a passing motorist set off Vikas's senses. This was his only day for preparation, 
it had to be precise. Even chance couldn't get in the way. His backpack sat in his lap, smothered in a tight embrace. He opened it and stuck one hand in to feel around. One by one, he counted its contents. He hadn't missed anything. The money he had withdrawn was in the front pocket. The notes were still crisp. Only one fold through their center made them less than mint condition. The larger pocket had more items in it. Without looking, he was sure that the distinct fabric he felt was the unmistakable black and white of a San Antonio Spurs jersey. The numerous tags were a giveaway. He hadn't worn it in over a decade, but it still fit. The number 21 on the back had some signs of wear, but otherwise it looked fresh, all things considered. Below the jersey sat a pair of baggy jeans. The ones his father claimed were his community service, wiping the floor everywhere he went. They didn't hang as loose as they once did, but they did fit. The last item of note had once been his prized possession, a red New York Yankees baseball cap. He didn't follow the team or the sport. It was his homage to the Limp Bizkit front man, who had been more than just a musical icon. You couldn't grow up in the early 2000s without going through a Limp Bizkit phase. When the auto stopped, Vikas got out and surveyed his destination. Sagar Family Restaurant. The board read in lettering that was only used by UDP restaurants. In a city where life moves fast, Udipi restaurant formed little havens where people find a moment to breathe. Mind you, it is only a moment. Most of their regular customers visit out of sheer habit. Scattered across the city, they have never had to evolve. Vikas sat at an empty table and a waiter walked by, dropping off a menu. He didn't break stride on his way to the kitchen. The menu was a mere formality. Normally, everyone knows exactly what they want when they walk through the door. Vikas took a few moments to decide on his order. This was too long for the waiter. He scurried through his rounds and came back. This time, Vikas had an order ready. The waiter scribbled it down, adjusting the carbon paper between the yellow and pink sheets before scampering across to another table. Though he didn't have to wait long for his food, Vikas had enough time to notice the conversations around him. It's just small amounts, one man said. Put 5,000 rupees every month. You will not even come to know. One day you will just wake up and there will be a big amount waiting for you. The thick Tamilian accent stood out from the rest of the voices floating around. People sitting less than 10 feet apart seemed completely oblivious to each other's presence. Each focused on their meal. Compared to the people around him, Vikas ate his onion uttapa at a leisurely pace. Still, within 15 minutes, he was tucking some change into a bowl of fennel seeds and lumps of sugar, neither of which he ate. He picked up his backpack and made a quick stop at the small toilet in the back. Had anyone bothered to pay attention, they would have noticed that he had changed into a pair of baggy jeans that seemed distinctly out of place. The rest of the transformation took place in the auto ride from the restaurant to one of the premier sporting goods stores in the city. On the way, he slipped the jersey over the t-shirt he was wearing. He completed the look with a pair of sunglasses and the red baseball cap, turned backwards, just like they did back in the day. As he walked into the store, he caught his reflection in the display window. To his surprise, the character looking back was completely unrecognizable. If Vikas had seen this person on the street, he would probably walk past, shaking his head. He walked up to the man at the counter. Can I have a look at some paintball guns? The last rays of sunlight in his room withdrew slowly until they no longer cut the bed unevenly. Content with how his day had gone, Vikas stowed away the packaging around his brand new paintball gun. He examined it carefully. He figured out how to pour half a bag of pellets into it. The bags of pellets he had bought weren't the usual multicolored ammunition. These were all black. He tucked the half-full bag neatly behind a pile of clothes in his cupboard. He'd already decided that the risk was worth taking. 
The first time he fired the gun could not be in the high-pressure environment he'd bought it for. He needed to be familiar with the gun. Some target practice would help. More importantly, he needed to know if the gun had any personality traits that might surprise him. If it needed a little nudge after a reload or a rapid burst fire to clear out the nozzle. They seemed like small problems, but they could cause absolute chaos given the wrong circumstances. A paintball gun would inevitably attract attention. If anyone saw him using it, there was a good chance they would remember it. Vikas left home and walked through his neighborhood. His backpack hung from one shoulder. He found a large garbage can. The metal container had about the same amount of garbage inside it as there was around it. It was nondescript and far enough away from home. He threw away the plastic wrapping. With that out of the way, he walked into a narrow bylane. He wondered how long it had been since he had been there last. The gate he turned into was already ajar. The watchman, perched on a plastic chair, looked up from the radio he was fidgeting with. It only spewed static. Before he could ask a question, Vikas said, Beaving, 502. It was just a guess, but the conviction in his voice was enough for the man. He went back to the radio, trying to eke out anything but static from the aging contraption. The gate at the back of the building was hidden from view by a row of parked cars. A careful survey of the compound confirmed it was empty. He made his way towards the gate. A lock hung off a chocolate-coloured chain. It didn't look like any key could open it any more. Bits of garbage had stayed on the metal so long they seemed to have merged with it. Blue, he thought to himself. This used to be blue. It had been years since he jumped over it. He tested each rung for rot before deciding it was safe to jump. As he climbed, he was careful to avoid unnecessary contact with the metal. The gate creaked and jangled in protest, but held up. Wild grass had swallowed what had once been a footpath. Now it seemed more like a game trail. Vikas followed it, winding through a place in the world that had simply gotten lost in the nooks and crannies of time. As far as he knew, that land had fallen into some sort of legal dispute. Instead of sprouting a row of residential buildings, it became home to junkies. A slew of complaints had forced the police to step in and clear them out. With the junkies gone, the only function the land served was as a boundary between the concrete and the mangroves. It seemed safe. A few shanties stood in the distance. But from the state of their asbestos roofs, they didn't seem occupied. What was left of an old maruti stood a few feet away. Bird droppings and layers of dust made it impossible to guess its original colour. There were enough trees between him and the buildings rising behind them. Apart from the mosquitoes, the place was perfect, a little pocket of solitude in the heart of the suburbs. He emptied his backpack, constantly checking for peering eyes from the windows. His plan had been well thought through. Hesitation was often the tripwire that causes things to go wrong. Once an old crate was set up as a target, Vikas took one final look around. The twilight around him was enough cover. Carefully, he began to test out his equipment. He was thorough. Not only did he work on his aim, but he did his best to understand things like range and splatter patterns. The gun seemed powerful enough. It even shot a considerable distance straight up. By the time he'd run through his allocation of pellets, there were patches of black paint marking various trees and random derelict junk. It was now dark. He felt good about how his day had panned out. Phase one had gone as well as could be expected. He allowed himself a quick joint before going back home. Instead of deep musings and convoluted thoughts that hash normally induced, he focused on practical matters. It was just the little things. How much cash he needed, what his day would be like at home and the fact that he needed to pay the electricity bill. Nothing out of the ordinary. That was the simple agenda Vikas had set for the day. Routine felt like running in knee-deep mud. 
As hard as he pushed, progress was tedious. Checking a clock regularly doesn't help speed time up. It crawled slowly through the day. His idle afternoon in front of the TV was winding down. As evening drew over, he was pleasantly surprised to see his phone ringing. Listen, Arif and I have decided that we are going to introduce you to a girl tonight, Garima said. Her voice was shrill. She had already been drinking. We are going for a movie and dinner now, but come out later. We'll introduce you to her. We? The two of you have become a we now? Shut up. What would you do without me? You still haven't called Amina. What is wrong with you? If it wasn't for me, I don't think you'll ever find a girl. Before Vikas had a chance to respond, she disconnected. He received a set of instructions that confirmed that they'd all be meeting for drinks at 9.30. His dilemma was real. Alcohol wasn't a part of the plan. The thought of finally meeting Amina again was enticing. But at what cost? He couldn't afford to be drunk. Once he'd reasoned it out, he decided to go through with it. If he could restrict himself to two drinks, it would make a great alibi, just in case he'd needed one. He'd tell Garima that he had some people to meet the next morning. It was a great excuse. It would be good to see Amina again, he thought. It had been too long. With repeated warnings running through his head, Vikas walked into the bar. It was a nice place. From the generally hip crowd that filled out the place, one face caught his attention immediately. He smiled and made his way over. Wow, what's up with this clean-shaven look? Garima asked. Before he responded, Vikas greeted the two siblings sitting across from each other and sat down. The one by his side got a wider smile than the one across from him with his arm around Garima. Are you applying for some jobs at a bank? Garima continued. Hey, always good to keep the options open, Vikas responded. You really do look like you lost a few years, Amina said. It's cute. It's been an odd couple of months, man. I need to find some work, he said. So I have heard. Garima told me you are going through a weird phase in life. Obviously, you will have to give us the details. I had to tell her something. How could you not call her sooner? Garima giggled. Why don't you tell her what happened? This man of mystery vibe doesn't really work with you. Not when you look like that. The only reason she wants me to tell you what happened is so that she can jump in and call it my divorce. I ran a company with this guy and it ended on not very good terms. That's done now. But I do need to find something to do. Hence, the meetings tomorrow. Don't listen to her. You don't need an excuse for not calling. You actually did have shit going on. Amina said. Excuse? I have a damn good one. It has nothing to do with any of this. These two banned me from talking to you because they were worried I'd make a mess of whatever the hell they were trying to do, Vikas said. What? Garima exclaimed. What an asshole. Please don't believe his rubbish. Vikas often depended on alcohol for his social prowess. On a day he wanted to be at his best, supply was limited. He sipped his drink slowly. As the evening went by, he found himself comfortable in the conversation. Sober Vikas wasn't as dull as he'd imagined. Amina mentioned something about missing a joint before she went to sleep. Vikas decided to take his chance. He pulled out the components of what was to be his celebratory joint for the end of the night and put it together under the table. When they finished paying the bill, he handed it to Amina. Are you serious? she exclaimed. Vikas merely smiled. Come, let's go smoke it, she said, as they made their way out into the streets. No, I'm good, Vikas said. That's your before sleep joint. I mean, you can smoke it now if you want, but I'm not smoking today. How cute, Garima exclaimed. Mighty kind of you, sir, Amina said, putting it away. Sure, consider it an apology for dropping off the grid, Vikas said. Apology accepted. Back home, the tingling sensation in the pit of his stomach was relentless. Vikas went through the list of the scenarios that could play out. As his last bit of preparation, he replenished the supplies for one victory joint, the supplies he had spent on Amina's present. 
From his window, he leaned out to check if the watchman downstairs had left his seat by the gate and shifted to the cabin just beside it for the night. It didn't necessarily mean he was asleep, but the odds were good. Vikas went downstairs. The air was still. His mind was running at breakneck speed. In the quiet night, sounds carried a surprising distance. His thoughts seemed too loud to conceal. Casually, he walked over to the cabin. He heard a faint snore. The watchman was asleep. He walked around the compound once and checked again, just to make sure. Some dance music from a party nearby floated through the air. He heard some shrill voices over the music. It's probably a party you wouldn't enjoy, he thought to himself. You'd just stand in a corner with your phone out, pretending you had someone who wants to make conversation with you through the night. The embers of coal in the banged-up cement mixing tray were threatening to die out, sending whiffs of grey smoke into the air. The old hero cycle that he'd been eyeing stood by the gate. Quickly, he grabbed it and wheeled it away. The hooks on its back gave it away. At some point in its life, its purpose had been to ferry milk canisters. Ditch it if things get crazy. You can get him a new one later, he told himself. He got on and began to ride. It made an odd clicking sound every time the left pedal reached the bottom of the stroke. Will this thing break down? Wipe down fingerprints after use. If someone asks, just say you took it for a drunken joyride. The thoughts were quick and disjointed. There was no turning back. He was committed. He stopped and stood with one leg on the ground, keeping the stationary cycle up. The old kurta he wore over his t-shirt had deeper pockets than anything else he owned, deep enough to hold a packet of paintball pellets. A beanie sat on his forehead, pulled as low as possible without hampering his vision. He looked like a man who belonged on that cycle. The handlebars curved inward, making it awkward to ride. The backpack he carried wasn't heavy, but it didn't make the ride any easier. With rubbery knees, he pedaled. He looked as uncomfortable as he felt, paying close attention to each car that went by. His route was longer than it needed to be, but it avoided ATMs and plush residential buildings. His body resented the few hundred meters of extra pedaling, but he was less likely to pass a CCTV camera. The last time he got into serious trouble, it was a byproduct of alcohol, sleep deprivation and maybe even a build-up of frustration that had picked a bad time to let itself out. He hadn't gone looking for it. This time, he rode, in the most ridiculous outfit he could put together, straight towards trouble. A few months, that's all it had been. The holding in front of him towered over the street. It was supported by metal beams that had been welded to a fence behind it. The fence was built around some land demarcated for construction, but work hadn't started yet. Vikas stopped a few meters away from the base, and looked up. It was high. The base of the frame stood at least 15 feet off the ground. The parts of it he would aim for were considerably higher. There was no point in standing on ceremony. He pulled out his paintball gun. The first two shots he fired hit the sheet metal with loud thuds. They jolted his senses. Nervously, he glanced around. There seemed to be no immediate danger. His heart was racing. The splatter marks on the image weren't as large as he'd hoped for. Half a pedal stroke brought him closer to the holding. This time, the pellets hit at a more acute angle. Each splatter mark covered a larger area. The sound they made was not as loud. The first time he managed to hit Parag's face, a rush of excitement flowed through him. Without pausing to appreciate his work, he unleashed a final volley and hastily pedaled away. Most of Parag's face and the party logo had been smeared with black splatter. The adrenaline had truly kicked in. Telling himself to calm down did not help.
he decided to ride the kick. Only time would tell if it was a good decision. Panting, he arrived at his next target. Once he settled into a position that satisfied him, he took a moment. It was primarily to make sure no one was watching. Still, the deep breaths were welcome. This time the pellets didn't make as much of a sound. The quick barrage and he was away. As the night wore on, Vikas began to express himself. At the next two hoardings, he found time to smear most of Parag's body once his face was blackened. He was developing more control. Each time around, it took him fewer seconds. He even fired a cluster of pellets at an adjacent billboard. A little thank you to his telephone service provider for their long-standing hate-apathy relationship. When he'd hit six hoardings, it would seem reasonable to believe that a point had been made. Six or twenty made no difference. That wasn't the sort of thinking that Vikas subscribed to. He was going to stick to the plan. The plan said eight. He'd left the last two for the end. The reasons were risk and not geography. These were the largest of the lot. The next street was more exposed than any he had been on. He waited as a set of headlights drew closer. The car didn't slow as it passed him. He waited further until the red tail lights were mere specks. They bounced up and down as the car tackled potholes further down the road. He was in position. This one would be a risk. He felt more vulnerable than he had all night. He could only hope that no one was watching from the windows around him. It was difficult to be sure. He felt certain he'd see the headlights of an oncoming car well before its passengers saw him. All he had to do was slip the gun into the backpack sitting open on his handlebars and press down on the pedal. It seemed reasonable. The waiting only made things worse. Once the tail lights faded from view, he got to work. He fired his shots in rapid succession. The sheer size of the billboard meant it took him longer to cover Parag's face. It wasn't very neat. There was no flare. This particular location called for function over finesse. Put, 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 put. The gun rattled. When he was done, he stuffed the gun into the bag. He was already on the move before he zipped it up. He gasped for each shallow breath he took. His feet drove down on the pedals. The clicking sound had become louder, but even fear of the cycle breaking down wasn't enough for him to slow down. The rickety machine held up, barely. After a series of perpendicular turns, he felt sure he was not followed. The first turn nearly ended in a crash. The cycle wasn't built to round corners at that speed. When he stopped to catch his breath, his eyes darted anxiously, watching for traffic. A few vehicles passed by, but none of them slowed down. His gun was empty. He poured the pellets from his pocket into the chamber. His hands were trembling. Just one more and you are done, he told himself. He used his voice, not his thoughts. He needed to calm himself. For a moment he toyed with the idea of ending his night, but quickly dismissed it. The finish was in sight. It was stupid to quit. Not the kind of stupid that drove his actions that night. It was just a trick. All he really had to do was convince his mind that things were going according to plan. All the anxiousness came from fear of consequences. It was simply an exercise in misdirection, getting his brain to focus on simple tasks to distract it from larger issues. Simple sleight of mind, it seemed to work. After a short ride, he got off the cycle for the first time since he had left his building. Carefully, he parked it beside a small aluminium cupboard that functioned as a cobbler's workshop during the day. He'd been to this apartment building many times before. The watchman wasn't by the gate. Quickly, Vikas patted the pocket of his jeans. The box of cigarettes inside seemed a little squashed, but it was still there. It had been around three years since he'd made regular visits to the place. It was where Malvika had lived. Sometimes, the two of them would go up to her terrace to smoke a joint. Either before or after, 
they went to her house and got down to the serious business of casual sex. She had moved to Canada. They had promised each other it wouldn't happen, but they had lost touch. Vikas hoped the building still employed the same watchman. The man had often caught the two of them in deep conversation with a joint for company. They would always hand him a fresh joint, never the one they were sharing. A bribe for his silence, disguised as a gesture of camaraderie. Once, Vikas had told the watchman that the building had good vibes and he liked smoking there. Both of them knew it was the company that brought Vikas back, but it made for good small talk. Three years later, this was to be his excuse. In case the watchman did catch him, Vikas would tell him that he simply missed the terrace and even though the girl was no longer around, he felt like a smoke for old time's sake. As soon as he'd slipped past the small room full of electricity meters, he spotted the nail that stuck out of the wall. Two sets of keys hung from it. Neither of the keychains looked familiar, so he pocketed them both. The service elevator was working. He took it up to the seventh floor. It was only when he had to climb one flight of stairs did he feel his thigh muscles cry out in agony. He wasn't used to the pedaling. The door was locked, but the first key he tried worked. He had to force the door open with his shoulder. He cringed at the sound it made. Cautiously, he walked around the terrace to make sure he was alone. There was a bed under the water tank, but none of the watchmen were around. He turned his attention to what stood on top of the water tank. On top of a metal scaffolding fastened to the tank was the largest of the hoardings he had encountered. As quickly as he could, he emptied his remaining pellets onto the hoarding. It made more noise than he anticipated, but felt secure. The hoarding was visible from a considerable distance and had powerful lights focused on it. He just assumed nobody was paying attention to it. It was the kind of baseless assumption that unravels the best made plans. With his last few shots, he even drew the best smiley face he could manage. Whether it was an artist signing his work or his little tribute to Tyler Durden's project Mayhem, he would never tell. The cycle was waiting for him where he'd parked it. He made his way back quickly, stopping only to put the keys back on the nail. The ride home was calm. He took a planned detour. The route led him to a bridge that crossed a narrow creek flowing through the mangroves. Before he pedaled up the bridge, he stopped to pick up two heavy stones from the street. He loaded them into his backpack. He heard a little crack as one of them landed on his paintball gun. It didn't matter. With a considerably heavier backpack, Vikas walked the cycle up the bridge. He put the bag on the ground and paused to take a long piss. The stream splashed across the guardrail and trickled along the footpath. He felt lighter. The adrenaline was wearing off. The water below the bridge was a nasty black, no different from the way it looked during the day. He glanced in either direction and picked up the backpack, holding it by its straps. Apart from two stones, it contained an old kurta, a sweaty beanie, a brand new paintball gun, a Tim Duncan jersey, a red New York Yankees baseball cap and a packet of cigarettes he didn't have to offer the watchman. He spun around once to build momentum and hurled the backpack off the bridge. It looked a bit like an Olympic hammer throw without any of the grace. There was a splash as the bag hit the surface and then not much else. Basik chakkar mar ke dekhna tha. The excuse was ready but Vikas didn't need it. The watchman was still asleep when he got back. He put the cycle back where he'd taken it from. He smiled at the old machine that had served him well. As he sat on his terrace with his celebratory joint, the scale of his achievement dawned on him. With each puff he took, the swarm of thoughts buzzing through his head settled a little. By the time he was finished, his mind was calm. The only thing in his head was the catchy beat from an old pentagram song looping over and over. Disconnected, disconnected, you and me, we are so unaffected.